Who was this guy, Pharaoh? Why is he so prominent in the Torah? If he was simply a petty-minded, stubborn dictator, why would he get so much coverage? Why would he be quoted so often? Why wouldn't he simply be described in simple outline? He was stubborn. He refused to let the Jews go after play, despite plague after plague. And it wasn't until the 10th plague that he let them go. Why record all the conversations and everything he said to, to, to Moshe and what Moshe said to him? And it gives, it gives the impression that he was not a shmendrik. He was not a nobody. And that what he said is in some way eternally relevant because it will always be part of the Torah. So let's take a closer look at this guy. When Moshe comes to Pharaoh and says, the God of Israel says to let his people go so that they can serve him. Pharaoh says, who is this God of Israel? What he meant, as the Talmud tells us, what he meant was, I've heard of many gods. I think I've heard of every god. I've never heard of the God of Israel. What is this? This is new to me. And part of what he meant was, I, I know that there is Elohim. Because despite all the idolatry that was going on back then, the idolaters themselves knew that God was the God of gods. They didn't really think that the, that, the, uh, that the idol that they were worshiping actually created the world. They knew that there was an awesome creator who was the God of gods, but once he created the world, he was no longer interested, and he appointed the smaller gods, with a small g, to uh, maintain and, and run the creation. And God went on to do other things. So they knew that there was Elohim. And they called him Elokad Elokaya, the Elohim of all Elohims. But when Moshe came and spoke to Pharaoh, he used the name Hashem. He pronounced it the way it was pronounced back then. And that name Pharaoh had never heard. What Pharaoh knew is that God had created the world, obviously, with a plan. The plan was that this world should serve him. It should be his home, his dwelling place. And how do we make the world a dwelling place? How does he make the world a dwelling place? He chooses a people and he gives them the responsibility to turn the lowest world into the highest world. To take the material that is the lowest material and turn it into the highest functioning, highest serving creation. So Pharaoh decides, I'm also a god, so I will do what God does. I will take the children of Israel and I will give them a task of building buildings out of the lowest material possibly available, and that is mud and straw. Take these elements, make bricks out of them, put them together in a constructive way, and build buildings. So you're elevating the lowest materials that are useless in their raw form, and you're turning them into storage houses, um, a place where the Pharaoh himself 
stores his treasures. Pretty much like God. And because he considered himself God, when he tasks or appoints the Jews to this, to this mission, there is no option. God spoke and it must be. And so the Jews were enslaved. So we see right away that Pharaoh was no lightweight. How did he know all this? Now there's another thing. Moshe comes and says, we need to go into the desert for three days. We have a holiday to serve God. Pharaoh says, I think this is laziness. You're distracting your people from their task. In fact, this quest, this desire to go out into the desert as a, looking for a religious experience, it's a bad idea, very bad idea. It's irresponsible. People who go out into the desert looking for a religious experience, as we see from history, end up killing themselves. It's not a good idea. In practical terms, Pharaoh was saying, yes, the Jews are working very hard, but constructively, they're building the future. Egypt was the future. It was advanced in science, in medicine, in philosophy, in astronomy, astrology. They were, they were, they were the top of the, of, of the world at that time. And, and, and we know this. We know this from, from what we see the mystery of how they built the pyramids. It's mind boggling. How they uh, embalmed bodies that look fresh almost 4,000 years later. We don't know how they did that. So they were a very sophisticated and advanced people. We're also told that they didn't use sticks or, or flint stones to, to make fire. Not sure how they did it, but they made fire from fire. They, they, they were not, there was no crude uh, fire making uh, like the caveman image. So they were very advanced. So Pharaoh says, you're working hard, but it's good. You're part of the future. You're part of the advancement of, of technology and science and, and, and the future, mankind. What's gonna happen if you go out into the desert? You'll wander around like a bunch of nomads looking for a religious experience. You're, you're gonna become worthless. Worthless, you'll amount to nothing. You'll forevermore be living in, in tents, moving from place to place with a couple of lambs and a couple of goats. What, what are you doing? After a couple of plagues, Pharaoh says, well, look, if you must go, take a couple of guys. What do you need, a minion? You need 10 guys? Take 10 guys, go do your thing and come back. And Moshe says, no. Young and old, men and women, we're all going. And Pharaoh said, no, de no deal. Irresponsible, unbelievable. You're going to regret it. I see blood in the future. 
in your future. And he, and he was right, it was the blood of circumcision. But a few plagues later, Pharaoh again says, okay, fine, go, but don't go far and don't take your cattle so that I know you'll come back. And Moshe says, no, we got to take all our cattle, even though it was only going to be for three days. But we never know how many sacrifices God might need. So we're going to take all our cattle plus some of yours. So Pharaoh said, oh, that's crazier than I imagined. I changed my mind. You cannot go. Finally, it dawned on Pharaoh that the Jews were not looking for a religious experience. This was the big shocker. This is really the essence of what Pesach is all about. We were not looking for a religious experience. In fact, we weren't even looking for God. We were terribly enslaved. We had no time to think philosophical thoughts or even religious thoughts. When Moshe comes to the Jewish people, they don't hear what he's saying. He's talking to, to, to people who are, who are tuned out, so crushed by their, by their task. They can't hear what he's saying. So when Pharaoh assumed that the Jews want to go out looking for a religious experience, he was correct in saying, that's lazy. That's useless. That's dangerous. It dawned on him that the Jews were not looking for a religious experience. They weren't trying to invent a new religion. They weren't looking for another God. He finally understood the difference between Elohim and Hashem. Elohim we usually associate with nature. But Hashem is associated with God's plan. So Pharaoh eventually realized that what Moshe was saying is not we want to find a God. God, the creator, is looking for us. When he heard that, everything changed. He said, if that's the case, then you must go. So yes, it was the 10th plague that finally broke his uh, resistance. But why not, why not send the 10th plague right from the start? If that's what, if that's what it took, why the first nine? So you could make the argument that each plague softened him up a little bit, but it doesn't sound that way. It sounds like after the ninth plague, he was unmoved. God hardened his heart. The tenth plague, all of a sudden, he's chasing them out of Israel, out of Egypt because he was afraid that he would die, because he was also a firstborn. These are all practical explanations, but there seems to be something more going on. By the 10th plague, Pharaoh was saying, if this is God calling you, then you must go. It's a different story. I thought you were looking for a religious experience like a bunch of religious crackpots, and therefore I, I couldn't let you go. After three days in the desert, Pharaoh said, wait a minute. They said God needed them for three days. They're not coming back. So the whole thing was a lie. Changed his mind again, and he got his chariots together, and he chased the Jews into the sea. Well, he ended up in the sea. That is the story of the exodus from Egypt and Pharaoh's role in it. Incidentally, God hardening his heart 
doesn't seem to be just. You harden his heart and then you punish him for not letting the Jews go. The meaning of it is that God didn't cause him to enslave the Jews or keep them enslaved. God hardened his heart to not be intimidated by the plague. That it shouldn't be the plague that finally changes his mind, but the understanding and the realization that God is calling his people. So God hardened his heart that the frogs should not be the reason he lets the Jews go, or the blood of the Nile, or the other plagues. But the resistance and the refusal to let the Jews go, this was Pharaoh's choice. This was him being himself. God didn't tamper with his free choice. Before I continue with my monologue, where I do all the talking, I want to invite you to a VIP session, a Zoom session, in which we get together to actually have a conversation and discuss all things Jewish, all things holy, all things healthy. So click on the link below and join us where we can have a two-way conversation. Now, if we look at the story uh, in that light, this issue of looking for religion versus being responsible, productive, and involved in, um, in the advancement of sciences and technology and industry. Th this is a question that's been plaguing us all of our history. When Jews were in Spain, we had the same question. Should we be different and send our kids to yeshiva? Or should they go to the, to the academies? Should they go to study what, what all Spaniards study? And the same happened in Germany, and the same happened in, in Babylon, and the same happened in Persia. Wherever Jews were throughout all of history, there was this tension between a devotion and a preoccupation with Torah, with God, with mitzvahs, with Judaism, versus joining the, um, the majority in what they were doing in, in the constructive, positive side, like even communism. It seemed like such an important idea, liberating the workers, the equality, and so on and so on and so on. It seemed like such a noble idea, it actually competed uh, for the attention of the brightest, and the most motivated and the most idealistic Jews who had to decide whether they should be pursuing a narrow parochial vision of the world that is only for Jews, or should they become cosmopolitan and uh, universal and benefit mankind. And each time it turned out that what the Torah had to offer was the foundation, the bedrock of whatever it was that the general population was trying to achieve. And without the values and without the purpose and without the direction that the Torah gives us, none of their efforts succeeded. What they were trying to accomplish didn't happen. So look at what Pharaoh was saying. Here you're part of the future. Here you're going to go down in history as having improved the world and so on and so forth. If you go out into the desert and do your little religious thing, you're going to be a nobody. But where is Egypt today? In a museum. Mummified. Where are the Persians? Where are the Babylonians? No, nowhere. They're gone. And the Jews, who chose an irrelevant way of life, who 
we're very much here. Very much always have been at the center of life because Torah is life. We're not looking for a creator. The creator is looking for us. Very important notion. So that is the story of Pesach. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it.